now it's my honor to present Dr. Michael Parenti, an internationally acclaimed, award-winning author and lecturer. He is one of America's most astute and engaging political analysts. He has covered a variety of subjects such as history, political life, empire, modern day imperialism, wealth, class power, technology, culture, ideology, environment, gender, and ethnicity. His pieces go beyond the parameters of safe and permissible opinion. Give a big, big round of applause to Michael Parenti. some thoughts about how we have to talk to the people who live in darkness, uh, and there are many of them. The battle is for their consciousness. The battle is for teaching them what their own self-interest is. I tell liberal audiences often when I, well, when I can get to talk to them, they'll say things like, or some student will say, well, they don't care what we think. They, 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 they don't pay attention to what we think. And I say, no, no, my friend, pobrecito, no. They, that's the only thing about you that they care about. The only thing about you that they care about is what you're thinking. They don't care what you eat or if you do eat or you don't eat. They don't care if you're eating poison food. They don't care if you're breathing bad air. They don't care where you go, where you're sitting, what you're doing. They just care about what you think. And every day when they get together, they say, what's today's agenda? What's the theme we push today? What do we do here? How is their reactions? What do the polls say about that? What is this, that? Because they know, they know something that many of our fellow citizens don't know, which is that their power, their immense power rests on our backs. And that when we shrug and shake it, they might go flying and falling off on their butts. And that's what we've got to remember, that this is a struggle for the consciousness of people. This is a struggle with, I mean, it's a very difficult fight. I mean, it's what I've given my life to, and sometimes you're punished when you give your life to that kind of struggle. You know, we, uh, people who talk like this, what I just said a minute ago, you don't get tenure at, at uh, the universities. Uh, you don't get invitations and, and, and the like. Well, let me begin by talking, telling you something else you know about. This is what you should, we should be saying to the people who live in darkness, through no fault of their own, by the way, usually. The biggest global empire builder in history is the United States of America today. It reaches every continent and just about every country in the world. There's no other empire in history that can make that claim. U.S. political and military interventions display an impressive consistency and conscious intent. It's very simple. There's no big confusion. There's no big stupidity in U.S. policy. U.S. policy is very consistent it's very intelligently formed. It's, it, it's very, very well targeted. The United States supports, consistently supports those countries, be they democracies, quote, quote, or dictatorships or oligarchies or theocracies or whatever, those countries that make the land, the labor, the, the labor markets, the financial structure, and the natural resources available to the giant multinational corporations. And the U.S. opposes those countries that do not do that, that try to get out from under this system of global dominance and extraction, that might pursue 
egalitarian reforms and social betterment. Any country that, any country, forget revolution, forget isms, forget socialism, capitalism, any country that starts to develop egalitarian reforms and starts to pursue social betterment for the common people of that country, that country becomes a target. That country is then treated in the capitalist media in, this, in, in, in North America as troublesome, as hostile, as unfriendly to America and such. If, if you Canadians started actually getting a real social democracy here in Canada, if you started moving left, white, the whole American press would talk about how hostile Canada is, how it's such a threat to the U.S. suddenly, and, 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 the, and they would frighten the wits out of the witless Americans who believe that stuff. And they believe it because that's all they hear. This critical analysis, this critical analysis, the comments I've made now, when it's allowed to surface in the states, which isn't very often, it's dismissed as conspiracy theory. How many of you have been called a conspiracy theorist? Not enough, you should be more hands up, you're not talking to the right idiots, you know. You've got to talk to those people who settle arguments with a label. We, we call this conspiracy theorist. Sometimes they don't say cons it's a conspiracy, they say you're suffering from paranoia. They become little Dr. Freuds and they tell them, oh, I got paranoia, yeah. Oh yeah, that's what it is, yeah. yeah. I just imagined the Vietnam War and the Iraqi War and this war. I don't know why it came into my head. I, I must be nuts. Um, or the milder criticism is that we're cynics, which is cynical. We we don't we we can't we can't believe that our leaders, or, or, or we can't believe our leaders are telling the truth. We think our leaders are lying to us. I mean, that's just so cynical and sour. That you, you imagine that your leaders are lying. I mean, I looked at I looked at Mr. Harper's picture just today. I couldn't help it. It was in the newspaper right there. I was eating something too, and I and I, <laughs> and I said, "How could I feel anything but love and trust for that man?" <laughs> I just, I don't want to be called paranoid or cynic. What is it, darling? Oh, you didn't puke while looking at Harper. What? No, I didn't puke while looking at her, but I thought I, just implying that was enough. Well, what we have here is a political economy known as capitalism. Uh, I want to make that point because people don't realize it. In the U.S., the media never discusses capitalism. We live in it. It's going on. It's happening all the time. All sorts of decisions are being made. All sorts of imperatives are happening. But they never really talk about capitalism, really. They talk about capital in a way, uh, but not capitalism as a system. Um, it makes certain claims for itself. Capitalism is dedicated to only one goal, the accumulation of capital in the hands of the very rich, the 1%. Capitalism is not dedicated to prosperity as such, though it claims to be. It is not dedicated to a higher standard of living for all. In the 19th century, it was the capitalist oligarchs who fought against putting a 12-hour limit on the workday. Why should you work only 12 hours when I can get you to work 14 and 15 hours? They fought against a 12-hour limit. Can you believe that? They fought for a good 10, 15 years, right through Samuel Gomper's time in there. They fought against the 10-hour day. And they, and they fought against the 8-hour day when, when organized workers fought for that. Eight hour day with a living wage of some kind. And in fact, we're now fighting again for an eight hour day in the States. I don't know how bad it's gotten in Canada, but I can tell you the eight hour day is already going out. People are being forced to do uh, uh, overtime. We used to have, when I was a kid, overtime when time and a half, time and a half, uh, time and a half meant that if you earned $2 a day, uh, $2 an hour, 
and you did your eight hours, and then the boss says, you gotta stay another two hours. You stood those other two hours at time and a half, which meant the two dollars you get, and then half time again. In other words, three dollars an hour. And people sometimes didn't mind doing uh, extra uh, time and a half because they made a little bit more. You got a raise for those two extra hours and such. Today, there are workers now forced to work time and a half without getting any time and a half, sometimes without getting any more pay. It is even true among salaried workers. They have often find themselves putting in 55, 60 hour weeks and not getting any change in their salary at all. That's called slavery when you're just working uh, without pay. In fact, it's called wage slave even when you are getting pay. The oligarchs, these, pur these purveyors of prosperity, oppose public housing. They oppose increases in minimum wage, a wage that doesn't keep up with inflation. They oppose public schools. They're privatizing everything from prisons to transit systems to military units and surveillance agencies. Didn't Snowden's report, Edward Snowden, remember that report, the NSA? The N that was one of the big revelations to me. The NSA, National Security Agency in America, 70% of the billions of dollars it gets in federal funds, 70% is allocated to private contractors. So there are all sorts of people feeding off and getting very rich and, well, and fat and well fed from, from uh, the spending that goes on. Well, they oppose occupational safety. They oppose workplace regulations, not necessarily because, um, it's not necessarily because they uh, are, um, they want to see workers hurt or anything. They don't care one way or the other about workers. They don't want that. They, it's just because it cuts into, it, it minimizes, their, their, their job is, what they want to do is minimize causes and maximize profits. You see, as a boss, as a boss, if I gotta spend money, waste money on stupid things like a wage increase or vacation pay or, um, uh, health insurance or safety regulations. Every dollar I got to spend on those stupid things is one less dollar I put in my pocket. And my goal, my my, my goal is to uh, is to pay you as little as possible, so that I can make as large a profit as possible. But hope that other capitalists, other bosses, will pay their workers enough to buy the goods and services of my workers that my workers produce. But the other bosses have the same idea, which is to pay their worker as little as possible, have them produce more. So what we get, of course, is a constant tendency toward overproduction, underconsumption, and recession. And those are the, um, the problems that capitalism creates for itself. What is almost always overlooked is that capitalism associates more frequently with poverty than with prosperity. That's an argument I'm going to make. It, it, it totally denies the decades of propaganda that we've all been fed. But I could make that argument in um, about uh, 11 seconds, okay? It, it goes like this, it goes like this. The world is becoming increasingly capitalistic and the world is becoming increasingly poor. Most of the world is capitalist and most of the world is poor. There's capitalist Indonesia. It's got poverty, no services, no protections, a free market paradise, a nightmare. Capitalist Indonesia, capitalist Nigeria, capitalist India, capitalist Colombia and Guatemala, and much of capital, much of Africa, which is capitalist. These areas are not often even thought of as being capitalist, you see, but they are. They're run by and for the capitalists. And of course, capitalist North America. <clears throat> The 
more successful the plutocracy is in privatizing and deregulating and rolling back, the richer becomes the 1% and the tougher it gets for us. Here's another point. Um, the number of poor, the number of poor people in the world is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. In other words, poverty is spreading. As free market ideology spreads, so does poverty. In a country like Indonesia, capitalism is much more successful than it is in a country like Norway. In Norway, there are restrictions, there are regulations, there are advanced human services, uh, uh, much of the capital is in the public sector rather than being all in the private sector, and it's used for the benefit of the common population. I mean, much, I don't, I don't want to idealize Norway. It's, it's, it's in fact getting hit with rollbacks too. Um, Indonesia is a capitalist dream. It's, it's a capitalist dream. There's no, there are no public parks in Jakarta. There, there are hundreds of mosques, but, but no parks. Uh, there are bus plunges almost every week because the buses have no regulations. There's no safety conditions. There's no health care of any kind. You have to pay. You have to bribe your way when you're in a hospital if you can get in one. Uh, you, you have to pay to get a, a bed. You have to pay to get some attention for this, that, the other thing. It's just terrible. Uh, if you read, there's a wonderful guy who's writing about this now, uh, Andre Vlitschik. Uh, you read Andre Vlitschik stuff on, on that. Uh, I've got actually some stuff on that in, in my book, the, the, uh, the Face of Imperialism, which they tell me is available right out there in the hallway. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a fascinating sort of a case study of free market at its purest. Because these free market idiots will all often write to me and say, the trouble with you, Parenti, is that you don't know what the free market is because the free market has never been tried. To really have a real free market system, we would all be happier and safer and wonderful. And I say, no, it has been tried. It's what we called 1900. 1900 was beautiful free market. Kids didn't go to school. There were typhoid and cholera epidemics in Boston and Philadelphia and such. Uh, but the, the, the death rate, the people, workers killed on the job was like four times higher than it is today, as bad as it is today. I said, that was your free market. There it was, the food, the, the meat that, that they marketed was often rancid and you could get sick eating the foods that you had. That was the free market in action. And this is what they're fighting so hard to get back to, so that they could have a larger chunk of that pie for themselves. Besides, besides pairing capitalism with prosperity, which is a lie, I hope I've just convinced you. I hope this crowd doesn't need convincing on that point, actually. Um, <laughs> capitalism also pairs itself with another mythology, with democracy. It is, it's not just prosperity. It not only brings prosperity, it brings democracy. Well, in fact, if you look at the history of the United States, the rich merchants, the rich landowners, the rich uh, corporate uh, capitalists, the industrialists over the years from the late 18th all through the 19th century opposed democracy. They opposed universal suffrage. They fought in the 1820s, 1830s in the US against giving the white, free white male a vote without property qualifications. They were against the elimination of property qualifications to run for office or even in many places to vote. Um, they fought against that. They were against female suffrage. They fought against black suffrage. They fought against the direct vote of the Senate and of the U.S. President. And we still don't have the direct, a direct vote for the U.S. President. We have an electoral college that makes all sorts of funny things out of that election. Today they're busy gnawing away like rats on what is left of our political vote. Voter identification is being cut, to cut into poor voter turnouts. Uh, I mean, how many of you can produce uh, two picture IDs? It's not always that easy if you 
if you, if you don't drive a car and, 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 and like, how many can produce your birth certificates? Where, where, where did you put that birth certificate? Uh, um, same day registration is being imposed in the US. Uh, inaccessible registration places. Do you think you're, you're a dirt farmer working hard and you get off and you got a 20, 20 mile drive to get to the uh, county registration office to be able to register to vote? Well, you don't go, you don't have the time. You don't have the gas, you don't have the energy. Um, strict laws to eliminate third party access. Briefer voting periods, back to one day voting. Eliminate limits on campaign spending. <clears throat> Increase the power of money makes public office that much more inaccessible to us and still more accessible to the super rich. This 2012 election that took place in the United States, this very last major election, the, the sum total spent on uh, on campaigns was $7.5 billion was spent on the campaigns. Democracy disappears when it has to be bought at that price. And, that, and we're just talking about political democracy, not, not social democracy. I want to point out something else. I read, I read the Wall Street Journal now and then. Can you tell? I mean, is it, is it? <laughs> I get it free. I get, I've been getting it free for three years. They keep saying, you have to, now if you will uh, subscribe, you know, we're, you're, you're going to run out soon. I say, oh please, let it run out. Let it run out. Um, but it's, it's sort of interesting at times because there is a lot, there's discussion there about the recession and about how we should really get things in order and um, job creation went up last month a little bit or this happened here and that happened. And, and you get the impression that they're concerned, but the truth of the matter is that the 1%, that's super rich at the top, does not mind recession. The Great Recession of 2008, as it's called by some people, has been just fine for them. Of all the new wealth created in this Great Recession in the last five years, 95% of it has gone to the top 1%. Um, in recessions, Big companies devour small companies, or not such small companies. They sometimes devour other big companies. There's a greater and constant tendency toward a greater concentration of capital. Marx made that point. Marx once said, one capitalist will kill many capitalists. And one of the endangerments, by the way, that capitalists uh, create is a danger to their own system. The, and one of the functions of a capitalist state is to contain the capitalist from destroying his own capitalist system through this kind of cutthroat, senseless uh, contradictions, uh, living with these contradictions and deepening them as they go along. Greater concentration of capital, minimization of competition, disappearance of pension and retirement funds for workers, Recessions impose a more severe internalized labor discipline. And every person looking for a job, they begin to really feel it in, in themselves. People work, start working harder for less. They line up for jobs at wages they would have never considered before. They have less resources and less means to build organizations of collective action. Labor unions are broken or put in line and tamed. They're politically immobilized by falling into debt. Our student body that's happening. It's hard for, it's hard for students to fight for social justice when they get out and they're facing a, a 75 or $100,000 debt. Um, they, they, people work harder, twice as hard to stay in the same place. If you're working twice as hard to stay in the same place, you're not staying in the same place. You're working harder and harder. You can ask yourself, as Canadians, for instance, why, why won't Canadians work for 14 cents an hour the way, the way they do in some countries? Some capitalist countries, they work for 14 cents an hour. Is it because you're so much more self-respecting or what? Uh, it, it, 
it's because, obviously, because you're at a stage of historical struggle where you don't have to work at 14 cents an hour. And that's what bothers the guys at the top. That, that you're working and, 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 you're looking and you have health benefits and you have this benefit and you have minimum wages and you have that. And those are just the things that are bothering them very much. That's what the war is about. The war is against whatever partials of social democracy you might have at hand now. Um, <clears throat> the financial autocrats of North America do not want people who have a high sense of entitlement, who have a high level of expectation, who are articulate, who are uh, uh, consciously developed in their politics, who are aware of what's going on, who want to own their own homes, who want to send their kids to college, even if it's a public college and who have the dream of a, of a good and decent life ahead. That, that myth of the great American prosperity, by the way, came around 19, early 1950s, late 1940s. It was a remarkable thing that happened around that time. For one thing, the, the war was over, World War II was over, and instead of the crashing recession that um, everybody was expecting. My dad was, my uncles, they were all working class, Italian-American, New York City. You got a problem with that? <laughs> and for them, they thought, when the war is over, when all that spending is over, we're going to be back to the 1930s, the way it was before the war, and the recession's going to come back on us. Well, it didn't, because they were making terrific money during the war. They gave, my uncle Nick gave up his $40 a week job, which itself was a pretty good pay in those days. $40 a week working as an auto mechanic and went into a, 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 an armaments factory and was making 100, 120 with overtime and all that stuff. They were making money. Money by, by poor, very low standard. But uh, they had nothing to spend it on. I mean, it was, well, Uncle Nick managed to find nightclubs and, and ladies that he liked and all that. But, I mean, you, you couldn't buy a new refrigerator because they weren't making refrigerators anymore. You couldn't buy a new car. They weren't making cars. The car factories were making tanks and planes for the war. So when the war ended, you had this enormous backlog of consumer demand. And there was a tremendous surge, a tremendous prosperity. You also had another thing that came in, which was the GI Bill. The GI Bill would put nine million American men who came back into the workforce, put them in and gave them jobs and degrees and new professions and all that. And it added to the prosperity of the country indeed. There were all sorts of, all sorts of American men who got a chance to go to school who would have never had the chance to go under the GI Bill. Today, the GI Bill is a farce. Today, these guys get out of the U.S. Army and they take, get the GI Bill, but they also then have to get a student loan and they also have to work part-time. And many of them just quit. It gets so, it gets so impossible. And they're privatizing the GI Bill, too. Um, and you had something else. You had the communist threat. You had a Soviet army on the shores of the Elba. You had in Europe two of the largest, in Italy and in France, two of the largest communist parties in, in, in the world. Uh, you know what the largest one was? It was in Indonesia. And then came the great massacre of 1965 and it was destroyed. And Indonesia is what I was telling you before, what it is today, a free market horror story. Um, but in those days, you had, you, had the, you had the plutocracies in Europe saying, look, you don't have to go communist. You don't have to vote communist. We'll give you, we'll give you the breaks. We'll give you health care. We'll give you this. We'll give you minimum wage. You could have your labor unions and this, that, and the other thing. So all of these things is what gave us this prosperity. And then there came this myth that this prosperity was an innate in a creation of capitalism and that it's always been there, that we've always been prosperous like this. No, we weren't. This prosperity lasted from 1950 to about 1978, 1980, and then started the rollback, and then started the cuts and the takebacks that we are facing today. Well, um, 
Thank you, darling. I'll pause again to hear it. <laughs> yeah, love you too, sweetheart. Okay. Sometimes the ruling plutocrats actually confess it. You see, I have a theory that sometimes words speak louder than actions. You know the old saying, actions speak louder than words. But sometimes words speak louder than actions because the, the words, you see, when someone takes an action, he can claim any kind of motive or intent for it. Oh, I'm doing this because I love you and because I know you need help and all that sort of thing. But when he comes out and says, I'm doing this just to deceive you and, and placate you for a minute and, and, and misdirect you and manipulate you, if he says something like that, well, those words will mean a lot more than whatever it is he's doing. And so every so often, I, I'm always keen to hear them say certain things. President Bill Clinton at the UN, 27 September 1993. Our overriding purpose is to expand and strengthen the world's community of market-based democracies. Now, let's, de let's deconstruct that brief statement. Our overriding purpose that's the purpose we have, is to expand and strengthen, not democracy, but the world's community of market-based democracies. In other words, capitalism is what he's saying. Market-based. These democracies have to be mar how do you How do you market-base a democracy and keep make it, make it with, a rich, with a rich controlling 95% of the new wealth? How does that get market-based democracy? Serving as Clinton's undersecretary of treasury, a loathsome character, L Lawrence Sumners, who everybody in America calls Larry Sumners. Said, what do you call him Larry Sumners? Would you have lunch with him? What, what do you mean Larry Sumners? L L Lawrence Sumners, schmuck, he, and he's, he quote, our ideology, capitalism, he says this, under Secretary of Treasury, our ideology, capitalism, is in ascendancy everywhere. That's what they're happy about. That's what they're looking for. That's what they want in ascendancy. It's marvelous when they come out and they say it. You know, you find, ooh, mwah, ooh, let me hear it again. Let's get the clip. I want to play that again. Samuel Huntington, Harvard professor. What a nasty letter he wrote me once about something I wrote. But he's dead now, and so I won't kick him too hard. But. Don't put down death. You know, sometimes death is not so bad <laughs> when they pick the right ones. And, <laughs> what was it Stalin said? Four walls for men. For some men, one wall is quite enough. But, uh, <laughs> Samuel Huntington, Harvard professor, that's bad enough, and former CIA advisor. He was only a former CIA advisor. This is an objective, objective academic, who, but he happens to be a CIA advisor too, who doesn't, who doesn't inject his, his own personal politics into his work or anything, but he happens to be a CIA advisor too. And he says, the United States is guided by universal political and economic values, universal ones. Liberty, democracy, equality, private property, and markets. Markets, he put got that in there. I said, well, you said it. You said it so nicely. <laughs> well, how am I doing? Can I give you a few more? Can we go a bit more? Okay, okay. Besides prosperity and democracy, capitalism also claims as one of its great byproducts is peace. You see all the peace we got in the world today? <laughs> more capitalism, more peace. It comes with machine guns, it, everything's quiet after the machine guns spray everybody. But mistakes are made at times. One mistake, for instance, I was listening to NPR uh, the other day, not long ago, and in quote, one of the commentators, one of the pundits, you know, they have, they have so much to say about so little. And they have so little to say about so much. It's amazing. It drives me crazy listening to these guys. And they, they always get into the superficial edge of things. 
Okay, the NPR commentator, he says, we can all agree that the, the Iraq war was a big mistake. I said, a big mistake? Again, in my book, I don't want to plug it too hard, but the face of imperialism, I collected the characterizations that are given to U.S. interventions, interventions by centralist and liberal writers, and even some who say they're on the left and progressive. Going on for more than half a century, this is what they say about U.S. policy when they're critical of it and it doesn't work right. Quote. They say it was reckless. It was misguided, inept, bumbling. These are actual quotes that they use to describe U.S. policy. When they disagree, when the policy doesn't work. You see, that itself is a, is a, is a rigged situation. I remember all through the Vietnam War, the debate in the major media on Vietnam was between those who said we could win the war and those who said we could not win the war. So that was the whole debate. And those of us who said win or lose, the people of Vietnam will lose, the people of the, of the US and every other country will lose. The question is not to win or lose this war. The question is to not have such a war and support and not support such fascist imperialism. That, that, view, that, view is, that view was never got on the air, never made it into that debate, you see. So, um, so what the critics, the critics of U.S. policy always put, make the criticism as a criticism of the ineptness of the people, of the policymakers. They see, see, I, Mr. Pundit, Mr. Media Pundit, I'm smarter than these guys who make this policy. They are insensitive, overreaching, deluded. They suffer from imperial hubris, overweening. Overweening means arrogant, uh, bumbling, inept. I, I said all these things. Um, <clears throat> we're left. We're left to conclude that U.S. policymakers are chronically deluded, stupid, incapable, again and again, of learning when it comes to wars and interventions. They lack the splendid intelligence of their liberal critics. The one percent are not stupid, brothers and sisters. Those who own most of the world and most of the wealth and command the coercive forces of the world are not stupid. They accumulate. They have no values, they have no honesty, they have no sense of what the environment needs, what is happening to it. They are there, they will crush, destroy, slash, break, chop, kill, dig, frack, all these things. They will do all of this stuff if, it, if they can accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. They are, I, I don't like to psychologize politics, and I, and I even have written against doing it, but I'm doing it now. These guys are crazy. They are, they're reaching a point where they do not know what the boundaries of survival are, even. Empires do, they do imperialism. Um, I make that point because all sorts of American writers are talking about the American empire suddenly. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished to see it. When I wrote a book called Against Empire years ago, I remember people coming up and saying, oh, Parenti, you're overdoing it again? America is an empire? Because we were never taught to say that about America. There's the British Empire and the Roman Empire and the, and the Soviet Empire and, and all those. But we, had, we, didn't, we weren't an empire. We had territories, possessions. Uh, but, but, but we weren't an empire. We would get involved in things, to humanitarian wars. We fought humanitarian wars to uplift all you, all you people. Hello there, can I bomb your village for you? <laughs> I'm really hamming it tonight, huh? <laughs> Stop it, darling, you're driving me to distraction. <laughs> So was Iraq a, a mistake? Let's just take that case for a minute, dwell on it. Iraq was a policy disaster? Well, not entirely. Multi-billion dollar contracts went to Halliburton and Bechtel, Blackwater, and a hundred other companies. The word on the street, and I mean Wall Street, not, not the street, our neighborhood. The word on Wall Street was the biggest area, the richest area investment, the boom investment is Iraq, right? When, it, when that war broke out, there was money to be made. 
immense source of profit for corporate America, compliments of the U.S. taxpayers. Um, war means record profits, record contracts, record military budget. Poorest countries in the entire world. I mean, it's down like 100, uh, and 188 place, or 170, somewhere around there. Libya, the same thing, a road from prosperity to destruction and impoverishment, and militant Islamics moving in. These very same militant Sharia uh, guys who we say, who, who our leaders tell us are world terrorists and we have to fight them. They, they hire them when it served their purposes. Syria, the same thing. Syria had human services. The refugees who came from Iraq and the refugees who came from Libya, the Syrian government gave them full human services. That's never mentioned. It's, it was a dictatorship. Yeah, okay. Why suddenly are you going after them? Syria has been ripped up by war. Nothing, there's no such thing as a humanitarian war. Not when these guys are fighting it. Iran is faced with sanctions and such. They all have to be bombed back into the third world. So empires, you see, empires see only two kinds of nations around them. And that's true of the American empire too. Either you're a satellite or you're an enemy or potential enemy. The satellites are the ones who are, have leaders who want to mimic the leaders in America. You must know of one of those. Huh? Harper and his harpies, as I call them. You're not offended that I spoke ill of your leader. <laughs> well, don't make any rude sounds. Okay. That the satellites, the satellites are those who are in place and stand in line. The enemies or potential enemies are those who are not getting in line, who are using some of their resources for their own development, who have a different opinion, who don't always quite vote the way you want in the UN and, and the like, uh, and that bothers them. Or, they, or the worst ones, the worst potential enemies are the ones who are so big that they, there's always an element there of uh, uh, limits of control, like China and Russia. Uh, they're, they're not that easily taken care of. So, so in the U.S. media, uh, uh, the, what do I mean the media? The U.S. president, Barack Obama, gets up and he says, our competitor, in, in the State of the Union message, he says, our competitor, our comp in our competition with China, we have to show that we... I said, our competition with China? China is a competitor? China is somebody I have to watch out for and look out for? Who said so? I got no fight with China. You have a fight with China? Who has a fight with China? There you go. The case is proven. <laughs> well, the U.S. leaders, they make, they, they, they play upon the, the American people. There was organization in India called the Indian National Congress that talked about rallying its youth. Uh, uh, a hundred years later, it became, there became a, a political party in India called the Indian National Congress also. But, but the same thing, that India would lead the world would lead the world to a brighter, greater future. You had Dostoevsky do it with the pan-Slavism, and you, it's right, Holy Mother Russia would lead the world and, and bring us to a better life. You had the Italian nationalists, Gioberto and uh, Giuseppe Mazzini would, would talk about it. Mazzini talked about the family of nations, democracy for everybody, and this would be led by, by Rome, by Italy. <clears throat> its third mission in history. There was the Roman Empire, then there was the Roman Church, and now we'll lead. Italy was, was ravaged and fallen apart and all that, yet he, he thought it was leading. So they all, there's a lot of countries, they all think of the, the messianic deliverance. And you have Americans who say, well just they'll look at you and say, this is the greatest country in the world. This is the greatest country. These guys working their asses off, getting screwed up one side, down the other, and they're up there waving their flags and saying, this this is, uh, this is something, and that's why you Canadians laugh at us, I know. <laughs> and and, and uh, some of them deserve it. <laughs> but, but, but to get serious a minute, we're dealing with a very dangerous false consciousness here. These are the people we have to reach. 
And when, it's, when the messianic appeal doesn't work, they do something else. They use the realpolitik appeal. They say the world is full of dangers and such. It's a fabrication of realpolitik. And, uh, and we have to go out there and we have to save ourselves. Save ourselves from these threats. I mean, in recent years, U.S. leaders have claimed to know what's best for Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia, Mali, Venezuela, Bolivia, Libya, Ecuador, Brazil, and sometimes even Russia and China, as I mentioned. Um, they always know what's best, and they also know, and this is where they get the American people. Like, the messianic appeal doesn't work, really. You remember the Gulf War of 91? Well, let me tell you about that. The political polls in America showed the American people were against, uh, were against Reagan sending troops into the Gulf War by 70, 75, 80%. And then there was an opinion poll and they said, if Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, the, the term weapons of mass destruction hadn't come into vogue yet. Uh, that was a couple of years down the road. If Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons uh, and is threatening to use them, then would you support the U.S. in defense? Well, of course, well, yes, yes. I mean, in other words, if you convince the people with fear, fear was a much more effective appeal to rally people around the flag and around the president. If people are convinced that their hearth and home and their children and everything else is endangered by this force, whether it be the communists or the terrorists or the this group or that group, uh, or, or, or these guys walking into some remote place that I can't even find on a map called Kuwait, uh, whatever it is, then I've got to follow my leaders and I've got to do it. So they will give away their freedom, their peace, their democracy, and their purse in enormous taxes if it means keeping themselves safe from the alien menace. And alien menaces are constantly brought up. So what we have to do is we have to get into this fight for consciousness. We have to understand and let people know that, that they're, what they're thinking is not right, that what they're thinking is a manipulated composition. We have to alert ourselves to the financial fanatics and destructive militarists and warmongers in our own nation and government. We have to challenge the lies and hoopla that they, that they propagate. We have to show how global aggrandizement and war do not serve the interests of people at abroad or at home, but do serve the profiteering interests of the plutocracy. The empire, my friends, the empire feeds off the republic. The empire, we have in the US now a military empire of 750 bases and some major super bases as in Kosovo, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan um, there's a few other big ones. Uh, well, Iraq itself, the Green Zone base and all that, and you can go on. Um, and meanwhile, we have a country where, where, the, where the schools are impoverished, where, where our, our bridge structures are falling apart, our infrastructure is falling apart. Uh, America is seen as a rich country. It's, it's fast becoming an uh, impoverished third world country. Um, <clears throat> so we should have to stop playing world leaders and start, uh, and start uh, understanding that we have to heal ourselves and really move in a totally different direction. We progressives, we, we um, true Democrats, and I think true Democrats are people who are socialists and communists, we develop a polemic, we must develop a polemic and analysis in an idiom that they can understand, that clearly lays out our understanding of what is being done and should be done. Um, make clear that we're not cowards or scaredy cats, uh, make clear that our opponents are not valiant and heroic when they bomb and destroy remote villages and whole countries. You know, I'm going to end by telling you about a student I had when I was teaching back, it was back during the, the Panama War, and, and he said, I can't believe what you're saying about President Bush. This was about the, uh, the old man Bush, the father, George Herbert Walker Bush, who's back in those days. He said, I can't believe you're saying he's going into Panama because it's a reformist country and, 
the people are changing and they're developing and and he wants to destroy all that to make it a better place for 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 I can't believe that he said I, I he said see, that's where you and I differ of uh, Professor Perini uh, I have faith in President Bush I said wait a minute wait a minute you have faith in President Bush what are we doing here religion or politics what, is, what do you mean you have faith like my grandma had faith in St. Anthony you you, you could take oh brown and you light a little can, you say, oh, Georgie Bush, oh, Georgie Bush. You know? <laughs> what are you talking about, faith? What are you talking about? He said, well, well I, I, I trust. I trust the president. I said, you trust? You put trust? What do you mean trust? This isn't, democracy isn't about trust. It's about distrust. It's about dialogue. It's about debate. It's about transparency. It's about disclosure. That's what democracy. Democracy is about the people exercising the power. That, uh, that you, you've got to. <clears throat> so you don't want to trust. And trust, trust is something you give to very close friends, very close relatives, where you put your faith in them. And even then, check them out once in a while. <laughs> so that's what we want. We we want we want. Um, we don't want to trust these people. We want to put an end to them. Uh, thank you very much. This I noticed you already bought it, but however you can now have a, a free. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, it's a it's a copy of a of a book that is written by Harjit Daldria, and it's a it's a book about two internationalist revolutionaries, Dr. Norman Bethune from Canada and Dr. Cotnus from India, who both worked and died in China in the international struggle against fascist Japan. Thank you. Thank you.